And uh, the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk about the intelligent edge. So a little context. Um, digital transformation, doing things with data, is transforming uh, customers today across two dimensions, the customer experience and operational excellence. So when we talk about intelligence, most people are just equating that with, well, analytics. We've got analytics. In fact, we've been doing analytics for, for quite a while. The difference is that we're talking about analytics integrating with operations. So it's not describing what happened with the business. It's impacting the business as it's happening. So the context here for the intelligent edge, it's how do we do that across the extent of the organization. It's not just after we've collected the data, but as we're conducting business. The, the applications and examples um, I'll cover here will hopefully illustrate that a little bit clearer. In looking at this, data is, is absolutely the key. So if you're questioning, well, where do I start with digital transformation, starting with the data is, is a great first step. I know when we talk about intelligence, most people are, th are thinking about machine learning and everything that's happening there. And we've seen a lot uh, happening in the news with respect to machine learning. Um, on the financial space, uh, self-driving cars, uh, healthcare, and just the, the great strides uh, happening there. So let me share with you some use cases to give you uh, some level set in terms of what we're seeing in terms of <coughs> excuse me, using technology and particularly machine learning. American Express um, has really started this journey six years ago. <coughs> and um, pardon me, the number two uh, person in the organization in a meeting said, we're not a financial services company. We're an information services company. How we leverage our data is key to our future and our survival of a, as a company. If you look today, they have one of the most sophisticated back ends to drive their, their fraud detection. So a trillion dollars of annual charge volume is detected at the point of sale. And they're not only decreasing fraud, but they're decreasing false positives, which from a customer experience is, uh, is ultimately even more annoying sometimes than, than a fraudulent charge. We're seeing a lot happen in security, network anomaly detection, et cetera. This is an example from, from NASDAQ. Um, their issue was that they wanted to dramatically increase their scale while decreasing costs and improving the intelligence that they're using to detect um, anomalies at, at the security edge. Here's an example from a, a retailer. This is the core business application that was running on, on a DB2 where they migrated and have an application that not only does a better job for the customer and recommends you know, additional products, but it's based on the inventory levels at local stores and what the latest orders are. So it's recommending products that they can avoid uh, inventory gluts and eventually store markdowns. If you look at the whole manufacturing process, um, the ability to use IoT and machine-generated uh, sensors as part of the production process is being used by semiconductor manufacturers to identify quality issues much, much earlier in the process. And not only identify quality issues, but have the sufficient data to address the root cause and correct them quickly. So when we talk about machine learning, there's probably a, a group of you in the audience that immediately goes to, well, what is the algorithm, right? Is this a neural network? You know, what is the key to this machine learning? Or there's another group of you that is jumping to, well, okay, wh what tool are they using? Is this, is this TensorFlow? Is CAFE the answer? Is it a Spark ML? And before we jump into the tool, you have to think of the entire process. Because what we're looking at is really providing the, the context of what is happening. This recent event, is this an important event? Is this something I should really react to? So the speed 
uh, your, your ability to detect and understand this context is also important. A week later doesn't really help, right? If you can understand what's happening while the transaction is happening or while the web page is loading, you've got a huge advantage. So it's the ability to take action. And increasingly, we're seeing this machine learning as part of an automated process. And an automated process that is leveraging various types of manipulation. So this is not just a database, or it's not just a streaming application, or it's not just file. It's, it's capabilities across all of these. So I started off by talking about the different uh, algorithms and the different technologies. But the real key to success is machine learning logistics. And 90% is the logistics, not the tool. And this comes from a recent uh, book by Ted Dunning. In fact, we're signing those at the, the MapR booth. It's an 80-page O'Reilly book that I think is, is really excellent at summarizing some of the important issues with, with machine learning. In these 30 minutes, we won't go into detail there, but it's important to understand how the data logistics play such an important role. And when we talk about the edge, we are seeing processing getting more distributed, not less distributed. We're looking at on-prem data centers, but also cloud, and not just a single cloud, but multiple clouds. And then with GDPR, it's not only multiple locations, but you got to make sure it stays in certain locations. When we look at IoT, it's trains, planes, and automobiles. Livestock, that's my favorite, if you can see that, there's a smaller favorite icon there. So we're seeing all of these devices, over 50 billion by 2020, but it's not just a one-to-one -one relationship in terms of source data and some centralized collection place. There's processing going on the device. There's processing at the edge. It's part of a concerted process, if you will, right? So it's not just about the data traveling in one location. So how we process this data is key to agility and key to success. If you look at, at big data technologies, the intent here was that this helps solve the data silo problem that we have today. And that's driven by applications are dictating how data must be organized and stored. That's a way to optimize for a particular application. But as you proliferate that across applications, it becomes a huge detriment to how we can consolidate and pull information. We're seeing that repeat in the big data space because of the limitations of the underlying architectures. It's a write once file system or it's an eventual consistency model. So if you look at the key to data logistics, it's about a data fabric. It's about a data fabric that can have a variety of data and have that stretch across locations all the way to the edge. And a data fabric must be able to scale and handle a series of diverse data types. So let me put this into perspective for how we're driving intelligence at the edge. So if you look at, at oil exploration and production, um, this example comes from National Oil Well Varco. So before, they would collect information at oil sites, both new production and existing uh, oil rigs. They would actually take physical hard drives, ship those, and consolidate those in a central location. Gather them in Houston, put all this information, process them, get some centralized insights. Pretty slow batch process. What they've moved to is a data fabric that extended all the way to the edge here and can accommodate occasionally connected uh, locations. So if you're out in the North Sea, they can burst with the helicopter that arrives, both two-way information. So they're collecting data, they're centralizing it here, and then they're pushing the intelligence back out to the edge. So every site doesn't have to, doesn't have to execute just based on their own experience. I can understand what 
vibrations and, and sensors indicate a potential drill breakage much earlier, and I can push that signature out to every location and have that respond appropriately. Connected car is another excellent example. So we've got multiple companies there that are processing data in different, different kind of stages of the life cycle. If you look at autonomous driving vehicles, the pilots that are in, in use today, one vehicle generates 50 terabytes of data per day. So it's massive amounts of information. So when we're talking about the edge, the first edge device here is the trunk of the car. That's the first processing spot. And then if you look at how information is shared there, you've got information that can be shared regionally, you can have smart city applications based on where vehicles are and conditions. You can collect that centrally, again, for things like um, driving conditions, per, uh, performance of the car, breakage, maintenance issues, et cetera. The last example here is a, is a medical device company. So here, each individual device, every MRI unit is collecting information, filtering, aggregating it, sending it centrally. So it's sharing not only the performance of the MRI, but diagnostic information that's been anonymized. That's collected centrally in the cloud and used to improve not only performance of the machine, but performance of the diagnostic capability of the, of the healthcare device. So, to make this work effectively, it relies on a, on a data fabric. And if you look at a data fabric, there are several keys to that. Not only the, the volume that it's able, but the variety of data. We're not looking at just a single data format, but it's a collection of data formats. It's, it consists of high speed information, so data that's in, in movement as well as data that's at rest. And increasingly, these applications, we don't have time to land the data first before we operate on it. It's a mix. Understanding the context of, of historical data plus the recently arriving information. But it extends beyond the traditional three Vs. We also have to have vicinity or the location awareness so that I can dictate where to process to optimize for cost or performance or meet, meet government regulation. And if you look at, at IoT, we are dis processing in a distributed environment. So the ability to have visibility across where all that is located. I can centrally manage even though I've got 10,000 oil wells that are all part of the same fabric. And to illustrate what that looks like, here's an example from the US Navy where some of the nodes are ships. So you can have a ship in the middle of the Atlantic and it's, it's a node that's occasionally connected. And when it's at port, then you can do high, uh, high streaming activities and download intelligence to, to, that, um, to that location. The last key for a data fabric is, is veracity you have to be able to trust the data. Increasingly, these are mission critical applications, the availability, the data protection, the protection against uh, uh, underlying corruption is, is a must have for a fabric. And that's where a lot of solutions uh, hit the wall. If you look at, at NoSQL approaches, it's performance, availability, consistency, pick any two. And it's usually consistency that's pushed off, and it's an eventual consistency model. Well, that really makes the applications fairly narrow. And if you look at most of the applications there, they're doing things like general direction for analytics. Like at, at Netflix, it's, I, I'm using this to recommend the next movie. If I happen to drop and corrupt some of the data, I'm still gonna recommend movies to you. Hadoop has issues with underlying data corruption, particularly silent data corruption. So it's okay for temporary and directionally correct analytics, but if you're trusting operational data, 
you really have to look at, at something that's, that's more mission critical. So the context in which I'm bringing this is from, from our perspective, MapR, where we, we excel in graphics that animate um, as, well as, uh, as well as this underlying data fabric. We've looked at how do you have scale and reliability and performance all at the same time, but, but support industry standard API so you've got a, a fast choice of the processing that you bring to the, the data fabric, including existing legacy applications through, through file-based access, NFS, et cetera. So if you look at the intelligent edge, there is the reality of where you're starting from. And the typical existing environment is a collection of different systems and different processes. And what we're talking about is a new architecture, but it's not put a new architect in, architecture in place and run them side by side and duplicate efforts. It's not a rip and replace. It's an evolutionary approach where you start with a series of tactical projects that leverage the same fabric and allow you to run existing processes on the fabric and lower costs, as well as pursue new applications that are pulling the data from different silos, but providing this interface on top. For instance, Charles Schwab has an application where they're pulling data from every system that a customer touches because they want to provide a self-service kiosk for customers. And they were looking at, at a complete re-architecture of the back end to support it. What they ended up doing is using publish and subscribe that's part of the fabric, pulling any data that's been updated, and then driving a web front end for, for the customers. And basically what that evolves in is a complete transformed architecture over time that's been generated by an ROI event every few months. So the, the customer journey that, that we're talking about can range from a simple cost offload to doing predictive analytics, recommendation engines, all the way up to more sophisticated machine learning. And it's not just for a single cluster on premise, but extends all the way to the edge. So this was a complete fire hose of the intelligent edge to touch on issues from machine learning to the cloud to the edge and beyond. So uh, appreciate your time. Uh, I think I've got time for just a couple questions. Yes. It usually takes one question. There we go. So I find that uh, when I look at Internet of Things technologies, and I'm, I'm not picking on a map hour in particular, but we're always looking at massive scale. Yeah, so cars and street lights and meters and that sort of thing. There's so many applications like automatic pig feeders and wind turbines and what have you that uh, aren't being uh, serviced by the marketplace at the moment. I don't know if you agree or disagree. Uh, so the, the book that I mentioned before, uh, there is a tensor chicken application. And it's an application that one of our engineers wrote because he's got a uh, he's got chickens and blue jays were coming in and breaking the eggs uh, of the chickens. So he's got facial recognition to recognize and distinguish a chicken from a from a blue jay, and uh, close the coop. So there's a range of of applications. Um, the the semiconductor is not a huge data volume example. I think some, sometimes vendors, and we're guilty of it, we tend to gravitate towards the ones that kind of draw awe and, you know, oh my God, look at the size of that. Um, if you look at operations and analytics together, that's not necessarily just about volume. It's really about, I've got an architecture that's got to do heavy read intensive and write intensive at the same time, and that's difficult to do with, you know, existing architectures, right? So starting with that as a, as a building block allows you to start small and, and scale over time. Well, thank you for your time. Um, 
We'll be back at the MapBar booth if there are further questions.